Hello, hello, you're listening to Akio Politics, a Harry Potter reread podcast focusing on politics in the wizarding world. I'm Adri, one of your hosts, and a recovering English major. And I'm Helene, your other host and producer of this fine podcast you are listening to right now. <laughs> fine podcasts and other goods. Anyway, <laughs> today's <laughs> single focus, it is chapter one, The Dark Lord Ascending of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Oh my God, we're on book seven. We're here. Oh my God, it's, it's the beginning of the end. <sighs> We made it. We did it, Joe. <laughs> I know. Gosh, I can't believe it. Last season of Accio Politics this is crazy. Am I getting weepy or is it just <laughs> post pregnancy hormones? And I've we only, will never know. I've only been working on the pod since the end of, of book four. And I, so I haven't even been here for the full journey, but it still feels like monumentally insane that we're that we're finishing already i know i know isn't it <laughs> ah, so weird and also exciting and also terrifying what are we gonna do next Helene? well as you know adri we have some some plans in the works we, but... have, <laughs> we have some top secret plans yeah those are <laughs> those are confidential so i mean obviously stay tuned if you want to hear what the girls of agiopolitics might be up to next but we're not there yet. We still have all of Deathly Hallows left to go. So don't worry. Don't worry. Just, you know, a whole <laughs> bunch of chapters <laughs> from Deathly Hallows. Yes. But before we get into all that stuff, how, how have you mm-hmm. been, Adri? I hear that you birthed a human in our in uh, our uh, hiatus that we took. <laughs> yes. I um, got rid of a belly and ended up with a human, you know, what? that was in that belly, apparently. <laughs> that's like the weirdest description of childbirth i've ever heard <laughs> <laughs> well i mean tmi but whatever this, this podcast is tmi um i had to have an emergency c-section so i didn't have to like actually birth the human the human was cut out of me that's not tmi i was gonna say starting out tmi with you know, the very beginning of book seven but that doesn't see that doesn't seem too too tmi i was carved out like a turkey <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's pretty that's pretty uh normal, I think, for, for people who are giving birth. It doesn't seem fun. It, I, I'm glad that you and the baby are both healthy. Yeah, no, it was a very scary situation, all jokes aside. Um that was not the plan that we went into. Um I was supposed to be induced on April Fool's Day, as uh listeners may remember. <laughs> um and well, I was induced on April 1st, nothing happened <laughs> on April 1st other than like contractions, pain, yeah, whatever. Wah, 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 wah. And then April 2nd, um, they broke my water. So uh, the induction was like pills and then that didn't work. And then they broke my water on April 2nd and then 12 hours passed and then I got a fever, high blood pressure. It was touch and go there for a second. It was very scary for everyone involved. Um, the nurses were very scared for my health. Um, so happy to be here. Happy to be alive. Happy that Miss Olivia Penelope is fine. Um, yeah, but she was born with a fever, so I had to be in the hospital for a little bit longer than we planned for. So typical u.s fashion i spent the entire hospital stay worrying about this bill is going to be huge how are we going to afford this <laughs> oh my god hashtag america am i right yeah hashtag this is america <laughs> god man well. I mean, it's like it's like oh i almost died but also how will i afford living <laughs> how can i afford to live after i after almost this. died yeah yeah but- yeah yeah. That's just so very American. But I mean, I'm very glad that you are alive and healthy. And I'm very glad that my little podcast niece, Olivia, is alive and healthy. And I love all the pictures that you send me all the time. She's so cute. Yeah, I am now that person. I am so annoying. And it's okay. <laughs> Honestly, though, it's kind of just shifted to, you know, pretty regular pictures of 
your dogs to regular pictures of Olivia with like one or two pictures of your dog sprinkled in. Yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I am intense in all areas of my life. Correct. <laughs> Not much has changed in, in the picture receiving facet of my life. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but I also enjoy the pictures of my, uh, feline niece and nephew. <laughs> yes. Little, uh, Albus, Percival Wolfer, Brian Dumbledore, Cat version, and Lily Potter. Yes. I mean, <laughs> they should have their own, like, little, um, you know, headshot background with, like, sparkles. Yes, we talked about uh, getting a cat photographer for them, didn't we? <laughs> yes. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Getting some real portrait headshots of them. Some, um, what's it called? Is it vanity photos? Yeah, or like... yeah, I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that. I would love that. Yeah. Well, while you went and like created life on your, <laughs> on your break, um, I didn't Creating do much. Life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't do much. I, uh, I worked, I relaxed. I went on vacation. I took my first actual vacation in like over a year. It was wonderful. 10 full days with no work and I was on a beach and it was it great. It looked wonderful. Yeah, it was it was a great time. Uh Cape Cod in June. I couldn't recommend it couldn't recommend it enough. But um yeah, I mean, I uh what had a life, but now I'm back and I'm excited to start this new journey and, you know, finish out the Harry Potter series with you. We have so much to talk about this this book. This book is rife with political commentary, and and we're we're not going to have a, a shortage of of content. Um, is basically what I'm what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I don't think so. I I don't think we're going to be like, hmm, I you know, I wonder what that is about. Yeah, it doesn't seem political. I like how <laughs> I like how I like went to go start these notes, and I was like. This first chapter is only 12 pages long. We might not have enough to cover in the first like episode. We might have to do two chapters. And then I read the 12 pages that this chapter was. And I was like, yeah, no, this is more than enough for us to Those talk about. Those are some damn packed pages. <laughs> yeah. So before we get to the Harry Potter of it all, though, uh, do we want to kind of discuss some of the big world events that we missed? Oh, yeah, like we the decline of society <laughs> since we've been gone? Yeah, I mean, further, we, further. The, I'm sorry, the further decline of society since we've been gone. Yeah, I mean, of course, we we go on hiatus for the podcast. No, no Potter watch in in sight for many many a moon, and then all this Potter watch worthy news stuff comes up that we can't talk about. Oh no, we're like doing the I, pod. <laughs> of course, I was like. Oh, yeah. So um, there's a leak in the Supreme Court that Roe v. Wade is being overturned. Why are we not recording the show? Yeah. And, <laughs> and then, then it actually happened? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Disgusting. Yeah. yeah. So that's the big one, I would say. Um, I would like to add that I have been reading a lot of women's stories. Um. And, you know, people with, with uteruses stories um, about them not receiving or not being able to access life-saving medication that is not even related to reproductive care, um, like oh, Crohn's really? disease. Yeah. Wow. So one of the medicines for Crohn's, Crohn's disease is an... Um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how to say this, but so I'm going to say the other word, the other a phrase instead of the word. <laughs> okay. Let me start again. Okay. So one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the medications for Crohn's disease and other related conditions, um, produces abortions, even though that is not the main purpose of the medication. Okay. So it's like a side effect. Okay. Yes. So because it is a possibility when taking that medication and you're pregnant that you will have an abortion and, and lose the, the fetus or whatever, it's no viability of life. Um, the Even though doctors are prescribing this medication to patients for Crohn's disease and other conditions, pharmacies are 
cho- uh, are choosing not to fill those prescriptions in certain states and across the U.S. And that is something that um, rheumatologists are looking into because they're being like their patients are being denied life saving care because the purpose the purpose of like the overturning of Roe v Wade is to put women at at the um point where it's like your only job is to be carriers of children right so it doesn't matter your status doesn't matter like what you're doing or not doing whether you want children or not we're just going to deny this life-saving medication yeah um so not that that should be the only reason why we should be outraged i think that we should be outraged because access to reprodu- reproductive health care um because abortion is reproductive health care should, we should be enraged and outraged by that because i i for one am so pro choice for any fucking reason cuz the only thing about like abortion is a is a solution for people who don't want to be pregnant. Full stop. If you don't want to be pregnant, you should be able to access this life-saving um, procedure. Because let me tell you, I wanted to be pregnant. I wanted this baby so much. And pregnancy was so hard on me. Yeah, you, you shouldn't have to justify why you don't want to be pregnant. Ever. Yeah, no, full stop. Um, That's it. It's your body. It shouldn't be stipulations of, oh, well, you know, she can choose not to be pregnant in these specific situations because that that's still limiting someone's right um, to their own body and and their their own futures. Really, Um, I, for one, I'm sure I've spoken about this on the podcast before, but I do not want to be a mother, never have wanted to be a mother. I don't want children, Um, I guess. I might want to be a mother in the fact that I, I might want to adopt at some point in lifetime, but mm-hmm. I, I never want to put my body through pregnancy just because I don't want to do it. Like I, I just don't have a, a desire to put my body through that. And I really, in general, haven't wanted children for a long time. And the only yeah. reason I can see myself ever wanting children is if I adopt. Um, so I, and that is your choice. Yes. I am. I am not, someone who has had an abortion, I will, I mean, I ha- I will be honest, I have not been put in that scenario in which I have, um, you know, needed to get an abortion. Um, but if I, I, and I've known this my whole life, if I ever did become pregnant ever, um, I, my plan was a hundred percent to get an abortion. I never planned to, to carry out a pregnancy if that ever happened to me in, in my lifetime. So, um, Thank God I have an IUD um, because I don't know what the future of this looks like. Also, I have to say, not only am I enraged because of that, um, the fact that I don't want children and this this entire situation is, you know, putting me in uh, in a situation where I would have to, like, not have, you know, what's the word, Um, power over my body and my decisions and all of that. Like, that's obviously enraging on its own. But I'm actually more enraged because I feel like it's an attack on my religious freedom as well, because I feel like the separation of church and state in general has just completely gone out the window. And not only am I and others being forced to um, act out a Christian ideology, a Christian belief um, that for that life is sacred and starts at at conception and all that stuff. um, That's not something that, all people believe, um, or all religions believe, but I, but not only that, but specifically Judaism, which is my religion, um, believes that abortion is necessary, um, in, in certain situations and, um, is required in certain situations there. It is written in the old Testament that, you know, you are, you are supposed to value the mother's life over the unborn child. The unborn child is not considered alive uh until until it is born so 
that that is like a, a core value of Judaism. That's something that my that like I in my religious beliefs, I I would have I would practice um, that belief. And I'm just not allowed to to. Yeah, it's it's, it's just very frustrating that along with the fact that they this thing that recently happened where they like allow prayer in schools now or something. I don't even know. I didn't, I don't even like it that. Well, it's very clear to me that all these decisions at the core of them, what they are saying is um, basically imposing Christo fascism onto America um, as a whole, no matter your religion. Um, because I guarantee you had that same um, court case have been of like a Muslim coach. Yeah. They would not have allowed his quote unquote religious freedom. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I lived it in, in high school specifically. Like I was told that I had to sing songs about Jesus in choir. And I was, and I wasn't allowed to reschedule tests that I had to miss because I had to go to services for Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, um, and miss school that day. Um, I, you know, I mean, like I I posted about this on social media, like a week or so ago, but like, if if you guys weren't already under the belief that, that, that the America is a Christian nation, like just look at the fact that Christmas is a federal holiday. So like, it's literally a fed. It's not. It's not just like a holiday that people get off. It's literally a federal holiday, a governmental holiday. Everybody is required to have Christmas off. Um, so like that. Like I, I don't celebrate Christmas. <laughs> like so many people don't celebrate Christmas. So it's yeah. I mean yeah. That's all I, I have to we say we talked about this a little bit. It reminds me of uh, the conversation we had with Shoshana. Yeah. Uh, last season uh, on the politics of calendars yeah. um, and how basically like these calendars are centered upon one thing and that thing is Christianity. A hundred percent. Yeah. And as a lapsed Catholic, it makes me sad <laughs> um, right. to be like, oh yeah, that was the thought the things you grew up thinking are normal very not normal um i will say that there are catholic priests who are aid are aiding and abetting abortion seekers so that makes me feel a little less ashamed of having been raised catholic i mean i think it's pretty safe to say there are are probably good and bad people in in, in every in every like micro society right like every group yeah. um you have your extremists and your your progressives so yeah um <laughs> but Just. i am it is good to hear that that those people exist and they're doing some good work actually they were the ones trying to help um jane roe get an abortion wow. back when roe versus wade um so they are continuing that work good even now um and there was a, a uh, the Vatican published something about how the decision from the Supreme Court is kind of not necessarily pro life because it's it's negate like it's it's not taking into account like poverty or like gun violence and other things that are more pro life than abortion. Um, so even though I don't fully agree with their point of view, I'm just like, yeah, but you can see the nuance a little bit more than other people. So I'm like, okay. Um, so we don't agree on everything, <laughs> but we can agree that this isn't necessarily about life. This isn't about saving children. This is about forcing women to bear children and then forgetting about them. Yeah. It's, it's about control of women for sure well it's also you know the more you control women the more you can keep them out of the workforce the more that you can limit their earning potential the the more that they can the more that they you limit how much they can influence society the more you can you know create this like patriarchal society and make sure that you know 
the the white male supremacy remains in control. The cis white male supremacy remains in control, even when they're feeling like they're being pushed out by more liberal ideas, right? So like they feeling they're feeling threatened and they want to retain the control by any means necessary. Yeah. Yep. Well, we're and they're coming for birth control next, and I'm really pissed off about that. I think well, they've already started, but yes. Oh um, yeah, no, I know, but but yeah, um, we're we're already at 20 minutes, and we haven't talked about Harry Potter yet. So let I'm sorry. No, I <laughs> no, I mean I'm. This is very important stuff, and um, I just want to make sure that we give our listeners what they came here for in terms of. <laughs> of harry potter content so uh we'll get we'll get to the chapter here in just a second but some of the other things um that we missed while we were gone uh january 6th hearings um have mm-hmm. been happening uh and they're still ongoing i think the next one is um ne- july 12th i believe um okay yep and, Tuesday, and they've july been 12th. quite explosive um but also yes. things we already knew yeah <sighs> So um, that has been very, very interesting, and I've been trying to watch those live whenever I can. Um, and then uh, many, many, many shoot- shootings recently as well have, have been plaguing America, of course, as they always many do. Many shootings perpetrated by white cis men 18 to 21 with AR-15 yes. weapons. Yes, there was the, um, the shooting at the, the elementary school. Uvalde, Texas. Texas. Uvalde, Texas, yes. Um, the 4th of July parade in um, Illinois. Yes, uh, the Highland Park shooting. Yes. That was it, right? That was yeah. the Highland Park shooting. Um, there was one even in, I think, like, Denmark or, or it was it Copenhagen? Yep. In Denmark, in, in a mall. In a mall, yes. So that's not even the U.S., but, I mean, those mass yeah, shootings no. there are so rare that is insane. Um yeah, there's just been a ton, too many to name, honestly. I mean, we could name them, but I think there, I think I saw a statistic that there have been like 68 in June. So, um, there have been more mass shootings than days in America than, you know, you know, yeah. just so, more mass shootings than days in this year. So, yeah, um, even though Appy Acupolitics was on a break, uh, giving our host some time to, life and baby and parents um the world (laughs) the world was not on a break and uh, america certainly was not on a break and lots of crap happened so yeah Um, i was on a break with america you know like like ross and rachel we were on a break like why (laughs) yes i'm i'm on a break uh with america as well uh fourth of july which was this last weekend uh, as of recording date um I boycotted the patriotism uh, and did not want to go see fireworks. I was like, I do not feel like celebrating America's birthday no. today. America does um, not deserve a birthday <laughs> for acting out. No. So that's a, that's no. my feelings on America. But uh, it's not like but what are your feelings about, about Harry Potter? Let's go back. This, this chapter isn't that much uh, more cheery either. So. <laughs> Uh, it's a pretty pretty uh, dark chapter to start the book off, but I mean it sets the tone for the for the book. Just for sure. you know, chef's kiss for this book. Um, in case you all forgot, uh, the Dark Lord Ascending is the one where we follow Snape and Yaxley into Malfoy Manor as they update Voldemort on their respective missions. The Death Eaters plan the capture of Harry as he moves out of Privet Drive when he turns seventeen, and the protection breaks as well as their takeover of the ministry of magic all the while charity burbage the hogwarts muggle studies professor is hanging above the table throughout this entire thing and uh she is only to be murdered by voldemort and ultimately fed to nagini at the end of the chapter she is hanging above the table and rotating slowly which is like the thing that creeped me out the most when i first read this yeah it, you know like the first time i read the book i was like oh the rotating slowly yeah. thing i like, mean Ooh. obviously this has always been a very disturbing chapter every time i've read it but i feel like that part specifically like hit different this time i don't Ugh. yeah it was yeah we'll get to it so um on to to hogwarts debate club adri what was the politic that defined this chapter for you 
Well, the politic that defined it for me with, I, you know, with the January 6th hearings under our belt, you know, <laughs> half, half of them at least, at least, uh, I thought the politic was seditious intent. So it is not an insurrection because it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Seditious intent is plans to overthrow a government, usually by violent means. Yep, sounds about right. So that that's how I <laughs> thought about this chapter. Um, what was your politic? So um, mine was actually extremely similar, but I took a little bit more of a broad um, view on it. So like mine was conspiracy, which okay. um, in general is defined as a secret plan by a group to do something lawful, unlawful or harmful or the action of plotting or conspiring. So like mine was like, Okay, evil people plotting evil thing. Your yours <laughs> yours was evil people plotting specific evil thing. <laughs> Correct. Specific um, evil thing. Of like yes. the overthrowing of a government. <laughs> yes. So like mine was just kind of, you know, all of their evil plans that they talked about in this chapter, while yours was specifically the overflow or overthrowing of the Ministry of Magic was yeah. Yeah, just perhaps because the January <laughs> 6 hearings were like fresh in my mind, I was like, it like my brain hooked on that right. passage or of of the chapter as the main thing tying everything together. No, I mean it's it's very um, relevant to what is going on in the in, in America today. So I applaud you for that. It's all, you get extra bonus points for relevancy. Yay, brownie so. points. <laughs> So good job. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the how we see it in the chapter. So we have, you know, Charity Burbage is like on top of the table. Everyone's right. talking shit. Uh, Voldemort is basically roasting Bellatrix, like, you know, yada, yada, yada. And Lucius and Voldemort's just like fluxing his power muscles. But also the the part that like I said, tugged at my brain as it being the one thing that unified the chapter was a discussion of how they, the, you know, Death Eaters were infiltrating the ministry and how they were going to overthrow the ministry. So I have my quote here, if you're ready for it. Yeah, throw it at me. All right, so it is, my lord, I have good news on that score. I have, with difficulty and after great effort, succeeded in placing an imperious curse upon pious, pious thickness. Many of those sitting around Jack Lee looked impressed. His neighbor, Dalahop, a man with a long twisted face, clapped him on the back. It is a start, said Voldemort, but thickness is only one man. Scrimger must be surrounded by our people before I act. One failed attempt on the minister's life will set me back a long way. Yes. My lord, that is true. But you know, as head of Department of Magic Law Enforcement, Thickness has regular contact not only with the minister himself, but also with the heads of all the other ministry departments. I think, I, it will, I think, be easy now that we have such a high-ranking official under our control to subjugate the others, and they can all work together to bring Scrimger down. Yeah. So a few things happening here. Yeah. One of them, um, we have to applaud him for being such a dramatic little bish. <laughs> right. And being like, it is, I have with difficulty and after great effort succeeded. Right. Um, so this is the way you talk to your boss all the time. Yeah. To, when you even want if to it took you, place. Yeah. Even if it took you five minutes to complete the task, you'd be like, you know. I, I moved mountains to complete this. It is with great <laughs> effort and difficulty that I, I have finished this email and sent it to you. <laughs> right. You know, like, yeah, he's, he's a suck up. That's, that's for sure. Because, you know, you want to, you know, let this be a lesson to us all. We have to be our own hype men, women, or person. Yeah. Because no one is going to recognize our efforts if we don't hype ourselves. Yeah. Stand up for yourself. Like, show your contribution to the team. Yes. Yes, but <laughs> The other part that is happening here is the idea of how an infiltration happens 
with one key person, right? So you change the, like in this case, right, it's the imperious curse. But if we were thinking about this in our terms, right, it would be someone going in and lobbying to a certain politician who has a lot of influence. Yes. And that politician then can infect, quote unquote, Right. The the people around him or her with these ideas, yeah, that um, may not be even in the best interest of the public. Yeah, it was like <coughs> abortion um, uh, restrictions, um, yeah. and <laughs> and and create a movement. Yeah, it was kind of like, say, um, I don't know, maybe Donald Trump and John Eastman, um, and the Federalist get- Society. Yes. Well, specifically Donald Donald Trump and John Eastman with their, you know, power and influence and and, uh, knowledge of law on on Eastman's part, um, working to convince Mike Pence's uh, general counsel and the White House general counsel that um, it is within the vice president's power to overturn an election on his own. Or, you know, say the Federalist Society infiltrating uh, certain sectors of government and creating a list of anti-choice judges for the Supreme Court positions and becoming the, quote, golden standard for these lists of conservative judges so that if a Republican president, say, were to have the opportunity to place three Supreme Court justices, they would be picked out of a select list that the Federalist Society, a non-government entity, a lobbying arm, has vetted on their own interests. Hmm. Yeah, um, not to mention, um, you know, getting them all to agree to lie during their confirmation hearings and say that they're not going to do what they do. So, you know, Roe is settled law. <laughs> anyway, um, Whatever. Yes. Yeah, let's continue because I'm going to, like, have a meltdown here. <laughs> uh, there's a theme. In case you can't tell, we're all very upset. Anyway, so yes. Um, very, very good quote. Very good um, link to sedition um, or seditious intent. Uh, yeah. in the so chapter. What's, what's your quote? Yes. So conspiracy, I kind of mentioned it before, but like it, it em- encompasses all of the evil planning that they're doing. So, I mean, obviously the chapter has a lot of, I mean, the chapter is basically the Death Eaters getting together and, and having a planning meeting um, <laughs> where they talk about, you know, it's like a status update. Like, Hey, where are we at with this evil plan? Where are we at with this evil plan? <laughs> Um, and <laughs> so could you imagine like yeah. the other, like one of the death eaters are like per my last email. Right, right. Exactly. It's like a, <laughs> it's like everybody getting together on Google meet when we're meeting remotely and just, you know, catching everybody up on, on what, what each person's, uh, stuff is that they're doing. Um, but I mean, this little status update meeting is actually pretty helpful for us as the readers. Cause we get an inside look into all of their plans that they've had and will have and, and are working on. So, um, and it's, and also like where they are in terms of executing these plans and who they have to plan to use to get what they want to, to achieve these plans, um, like names and such. So, um, for example, obviously taking over the ministry of magic, that was one thing that they were working on. Um, the other was capturing Harry during his, Sorry, my cats are about to fight. Get down. Get down. Um, another was capturing Harry uh, during his like move from Privet Drive to an unknown location, as far as Death Eaters are aware, but as far as we know, to Grimald Place. Um, and, you know, all the, all the evil things they discuss in this chapter. Those are the the main two but anyway so that that's conspiracy as far as like what how we see it in the chapter the quote that i chose um was a quote specifically during a conversation with beltrix and voldemort and it goes as such 
Many of our oldest family trees become a little diseased over time, he said, as Beltrix gazed at him, breathless and imploring. You must prune yours, must you not, to keep it healthy? Cut away those parts that threaten the health of the rest. Yes, my lord, whispered Bellatrix, and her eyes swam with tears of gratitude again. At the first chance. You shall have it, said Voldemort, and in your family, and so in the world, we shall cut away the canker that infects us until only those of true blood remain. Which, by the way, he's not even... A true blood? No, he's not. Oh, whatever. I know. So yeah, I mean, this is just like one of those like more broad evil conspiracies that they're they're working on is their their overarching one of of ridding the wizarding worlds of. Oh, so so their mission and, statement. Yes. <laughs> so their mission statement is, we shall you know it's like Voldemort and Death Eaters cutting away the canker that infects us all until only those of us of the true blood remain. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but that's what they went with. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, in this specific instance, the quote, they, they were they were specifically talking about um, Andromeda Tonks. Um, yes. And uh, in turn, Nymphadora, who married Lupin right before this. Um, and, you know... The fact that there are people who are related to these uh, these purebloods that are purebloods themselves, but you know, the, what are they like? What ruin the family name? I don't know. There's a better term for that, but yeah, dismerching the family name exactly. So we gotta we gotta prune that family tree. Ugh. Just the word canker there. Just I know, ugh. I know, I know. Right? Gross. Well, speaking of cankers. Um, <laughs> Voldemort to me was like the character where I was like you I saw like the politics of seditious intent like it's all his like master brainchild and he's like the little puppeteer with all the little puppets so what about you yeah I mean we picked the same one mine was also Voldemort um he's the master mastermind behind all of the plans that we talked about and even though he's not technically the one executing himself uh executing those plans himself uh most of the time um he is like the the puppet master right he's the one in charge of all of his little tiny minions and you know telling them where to go and what to do and having them do all the dirty work for him so yeah oh yeah he's trump basically all right so we've got a new uh little segment for you guys uh this last very last season of occupolitics it's more like a an an addition to this current segment but yes Okay, fine. Maybe we'll come up with a name for it, like a catchy name, but we don't have one right now. Um, So we're going to be talking about each other's politics and how we kind of see those politics in the series as a whole. We thought, you know, it's the last book. We might as well just do a retrospective while we're at it if we can <laughs> yeah and and all the all the other times we we've never really gotten to dig into each other's politics it's always kind of been like we focus on our own um and it's it's gonna be fun to kind of like you know do this last minute oh how do i how do i uh see this politic that i wasn't the one that thought that thought of it you know and how do i yeah apply no it? i i love it so um if you don't mind, Helena, I'll go first because sure. yours is like so easy to tie to yeah. the entire series. Um, okay, so if I'm thinking of conspiracy, like a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or ha- harmful, literally the entire plot of the series is Voldemort conspires or like a follower of Voldemort conspires and there's a plan in the background and Harry just so happens to like be the center of this plan and has to somehow get out of it or save the day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's very accurate. Also, I kind of thought maybe like conspiracy theory was also a big thing in book five oh, specifically. Yes. Um, also, we got Luna Lovegood as right. like our resident conspiracy theorists. Uh, uh, we've got um, her father, this book, Alina. So we've got we've got a lot going on on conspiracy, but um, conspiracy theories specifically, Harry is a big conspiracy theorist himself. Yeah. Um, everyone's always like, Harry, no, you're overthinking it, and he's like, like all of books. That's my Draco. signature move. <laughs> like his yeah, en- yeah, his entire yeah, like- uh, manhunt of Draco in, in the last book for sure. 
Yes. Yeah, no, so I'm like, <laughs> overthinking is my special power. Also, Expelliarmus, you know? Right, yes, exactly. Right. So that's how I see conspiracy. Ta-da! <laughs> Amazing. Great. Um, I, I, I just, like, this is not the case for this specific episode, but I can see how, like, we could, like, fuck each other over um, by picking really ridiculously hard or, like, super specific uh, politics. Um, hopefully, we will not do I, I, that. I will try to be very kind. I don't think I will, like... <laughs> Just do it on purpose. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just I'm, I'm interested to see how this plays out throughout the season. But <laughs> specifically for this one, seditious intent. Okay, so throughout the series, I would say um, the, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is definitely Fudge. And Malfoy's, uh, Lucius Malfoy specifically, like attempting to kind of like get in, um, in Fudge's like good circle and trying to, persuade him oh, to believe basically that. basically being a lobbyist yeah exactly well. like yeah. persuading fudge to believe that voldemort's not back and allowing him allowing voldemort to like get away with all this stuff because he is like you know kind of turning his, his eye away because he's got people like malfoy you know trying to take over the government in like that one very subtle way up until more recently when they're now they're actually trying to literally take over the government before they were just trying to take over the government like low-key you know what i'm talking about yeah just like um, um <laughs> like slight infiltration not overtaking like, yeah like like take over as in like influence the decisions of all the people in charge not literally replace all the people in charge you know what i mean correct yeah. um and then um another one i think would probably be um umbridge in in uh order of the phoenix like, because mm -hmm. although, um, and we talked about this a bit off mic just now, but like Hogwarts isn't technically a government, but it's like a system that's in place. And yeah, it's an um, entity. Yes. So I think that uh, Umbridge and also obviously Fudge working with Umbridge to take over Hogwarts and the way that they do things and the way that they teach their young wizards and witches, um, that also could be seen as like a sedition seditious intent uh conspiracy to overthrow the government kind kind of thing yeah that's... and you mentioned malfoy and what also malfoy uh you know lucius, lucius locks malfoy uh <laughs> he he is also on the board of the hogwarts trustees i believe is, is what yeah. it's called yeah. and he's trying to also overthrow dumbledore like yeah. not so secretly in the background of many a buck so that also ties into that yeah yeah definitely i think even in, he actually like succeeds a little bit in the second book doesn't he yes yeah so um so yeah i mean those death eaters they're they're you know bad people i don't know they're they're wily minxes <laughs> what do they get for their loyalty they get their wands taken away yep you know, you know, Voldemort is like the best boss ever. <laughs> I'm going to reward loyalty by taking things away from you. Well, I mean, it's not really he is he is actually punishing Lucius for the happenings of the last yeah, couple yeah. of books. I mean, Lucius did fuck up a lot the last couple of books. So <laughs> he is a white man who's going to white man like, yeah, he literally like I mean, lost the prophecy to a bunch of of like 15 year olds like he's a and gave away a horcrux right so yeah um we don't Fun like stuff. we don't like lucius but you know what else we don't like dementors <laughs> oh um, so say like ted cruz <laughs> yes uh yes ted cruz and dementors so the beloved dementors and chocolate segment is back i mean we couldn't we couldn't get rid of it we love it too too much um, so it'll be here to stay for season seven. Um, Adri, oh, actually, uh, do you, you want, have do to go first because well, my joke doesn't. Okay. Yes. I was going to say, I was going to ask if you, do you want to remind the listeners what Dementors and Chocolate is? Okay. 
Dementors and Chocolate is our segment where we discuss uh, the one thing that we didn't like in the chapter, much like Ted Cruz fleeing to Cancun um, in was that 2020, 2021? I think it was 2020. Yeah, sounds about yes. right. Um, so Dementors, what we don't like, like, you know, the six Supreme Court justices right now uh, <laughs> that are conservative. And the chocolate is what we hold dear in the chapter, what perhaps gives us hope, perhaps gave us a smile. Or, you know, in this case, in this chapter, didn't suck so much. Yeah, <laughs> sucked less than the rest of the chapter, for sure. Correct. Uh, <laughs> um, right, so we'll start with the mentors. I'll go first. Um, so, I mean, the entire chapter is evil and bad and, and dark, like we've talked about. So there are not a lot of of good things um but and there, there are, are a lot of competing bad things yes to pick. <laughs> yes there are a lot of bad things so it was like hard to kind of sit down and think of like what was the worst bad thing uh but i did uh decide to go with the murder of charity burbage um someone whose only crime was educate like take taking her skills and her knowledge and using that to educate young witches and wizards um, about something that they might not have, have been exposed to in their own lives. Um, if they didn't grow up around muggles or don't aren't exposed to like how muggles live um, or, you know, weren't birthed by muggles or anything like that. Um, and then also just, they mentioned in the chapter that she, she also like wrote, I, I think it was like an editorial in the daily. Yeah, she Prophet. wrote an opt-ed. So she was targeted by these people because she wrote an op-ed. In the Daily Prophet, yes, yes, um, uh, saying that you know, mudbloods deserve respect and you know, all, just like basic human, you know, kindness and care. Basically, you, mud, mudbloods and muggles are are good people, and they don't deserve to be. Are we sure that you want to say mudbloods? Maybe like muggle-born wizards. Well, that, so that's what that's what they said in the chapter. I guess I was kind of just like paraphrasing from the chapter. Um, okay, gotcha. Because uh, that's like what Voldemort said specifically. So yes, I don't b- believe using a slur like that is a good thing to do. Um, but yes, muggle borns um, and muggles and in general um, are good people and deserve respect. And, and that's what she used her voice to say and to stand up for that equality that she believed in. And uh, because of it, she was murdered quite savagely um, quite awfully and then of course the chapter ends on the just terrifying note of like nagini time for dinner you know like yeah how are we gonna get rid of her body oh the snake will eat her you know it's just it's just horrifying yeah like oh i got this the snake will yeah yeah so that was that was my dementor this chapter (laughs) okay so well well i concur you know that the murder of professor charity burbage is uh, one of the most heinous things in this chapter, I would like to point out another crime perpetrated by Voldemort. And that is the crime of saying the following. And, you know, so he said that um, he, he asked, he said to Bellatrix, you must be very proud. And that was um, in reference to Nymphadora Tonks um, marrying Remus Lupin, the werewolf. Yes. And he lost an opportunity to even make a better pun. You must be over the moon. It was right <laughs> there. It was right there. And he didn't take it. And that's why he's evil. He can't even see <laughs> the hilarity of this beautiful pun that he missed. Oh, man. Yeah. Come on, Voldemort. Shouldn't puns be like a high priority on your list of things? <laughs> You want to make fun of someone? That is what you do. You don't say, you must be very proud. Yes. Over the moon. It was right there. See, his his wordplay was just so focused on, on this the metaphor. Cubs. No, it was on the metaphor of like, you know, the pruning, pruning the family tree and, and ridding ourselves of the canker that is, uh, that infects us all of, of, of you know. Untru- what a wasted opportunity. Blood. <laughs> Over the moon is right there. Oh man! Well, you're right. That's equally as bad as the murder of Charity Bird. 
clearly. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway. I am trying to inject some levity into this, Celine. <laughs> Oh, talking about levity, do you want to talk about what makes us happy and in and, and the chapter, even though that's not really a thing in this chapter, but, you know. Okay, so the only chocolate <laughs> that I can at least hold on to in, <laughs> in this chapter is the white peacocks, because they are everything, and they're giving me, <laughs> they're giving me um, Vanderpump vibes. Okay. Lisa Vanderpump vibes like yeah. she has white swans in her mansion um Lisa Vanderpump is a of course a real housewife of Beverly Hills former real housewife of Beverly Hills and she's got like this huge like property in Beverly Hills that has animals and one of her main animal is her swans you know so the what, white peacocks are giving me swans so actually um you know what it reminds me of? Uh, not, not Vanderpump, but um, recently for work we worked on a um, a special uh, for Martha Martha Stewart. She did a great mm-hmm. she's like the Great American Tag Sale on ABC. She did this like huge yard sale at her estate, basically, um, and so it was like a one hour special where it covers her preparing and executing this yard sale at her estate and um she has white peacocks at her estate and that was like a big thing in the special they showed her like just like talking to her peacocks and like calling them like calling at them and stuff like she's obsessed with her peacocks it's hilarious so I, I watched it and I was like, okay, this is giving off super, super intense Malfoy Manor vibes. Uh, <laughs> so now you, you know something. Go to prison, you right, know, like. Right, exactly. So now you know something that you might not have known about Martha Stewart, that she has white peacocks at her estate that she talks to regularly. I mean, um, so. So for my, um, for Mother's Day, uh, Seth got me a bottle <laughs> of Vanderpump Rosé, mostly because we joke a lot about Vanderpump and like going to one of her restaurants, which is by all accounts, a terrible restaurant is you just go there to like, look at like celebrity, like Bravo celebrities, not even celebrities, Bravo celebrities. Um, and her (laughs) rest, one of her restaurants is called Sir, and it stands for sexy, unique restaurant. (laughs) I kid you not. And uh, so he got me Vanderpump Rosé for Mother's Day. And apparently it was like a $40 bottle of Rosé, which like I would never spend that much money on a bottle of Rosé. It was like 40 or 50. I don't know. It was like expensive. Um, And like I like champagne. I would pay that for a champagne, not Rosé. Anyway, and he was like, could you believe that it is as expensive as like a bottle of mezcal? And I was like, of course, like those swans are not going to feed themselves. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She has many horses, too. Wow. Well, that is a really great chocolate. Um, mine what about is, yours? Yeah, mine's not as like funny, I guess. But um, <laughs> so, like I said, it was it was pretty hard to find any moments of quote unquote joy in this one. So I, I will at least say that I did enjoy hearing Voldemort admit that the only reason that Harry is still alive is because of his own mistakes. It was great when he said like, Oh yeah, I fucked up. Like you don't get to hear the petty Voldemort. Bitch me, the petty bitch in me was like, yeah, that's right. right? You underestimated, you know, Harry. Yeah, so it but was, I didn't like that he said it was because like Harry was alive because Harry was lucky. I I, yeah, I don't completely he, subscribe to that either. He kind of he he kind of turned it more at the end into like oh I it's not that like I'm I'm bad at my job. It's just that uh this the odds were stacked against me or whatever. Like no, come on. But anyway, the quote that I have for this is I shall attend to the boy in person. There have been many mistakes where Harry Potter is concerned. Some of them have been my own. That <laughs> Potter lives is due more to my errors than to his triumphs. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you, you also, fucked up. <laughs> also, that's really interesting use of the passive voice. If you notice, like, 
instead of saying like I have made many mistakes where Harry Potter is concerned, it says yeah. there have been many mistakes, which is a, you, again yeah. lack of ownership. That's use of the passive voice, which which as a technical writer, I'm like, oh, I hate passive voice. <laughs> and then he goes like, some of them have been my own. Like some of them I have made. Like instead of yeah, yeah. Like instead of saying like I have made some mistakes where Harry Potter is concerned, which would be taking ownership of his actions more. Right. He, the use of the passive voice is um, distancing himself from those mistakes and then well, trying yeah. to like, oh, but also link it, but not really. He's admitting to mistakes in the most Voldemort way possible, basically. So yeah, and you know, in, in the most like mediocre white man way possible (laughs) right all right okay so another thing that we are continuing is our question of the week where we ask our listeners a question related to the chapter we just discussed and this week we want to know if you dear listener were uh voldemort so you have to think really hard on this one because i I I hope we are not like, oh, sure, I can easily be Voldemort in my head. Yeah, I was just about to say, put yourself in Voldemort's shoes. But then I was like, wait, does Voldemort wear shoes? Because I feel like we never see him wearing shoes. (laughs) Pretty sure he's like barefoot. Yeah, put put yourself in Voldemort's slimy, snake-like skin and uh, and answer this question from his perspective. (laughs) So imagine you have no nose and we go from there. Okay. If you were Voldemort, would you trust Snape over other Death Eaters? And why or why not? Yes. I mean, think about it. We've got Bellatrix Lestrange. Like, she's she's like Death Eater, like hype woman, like has pom-poms basically saying like, ah, yay, Dark Lord, um, <laughs> everywhere. And she's like the like subservient. Why would you trust Snape over her or not? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, Snape obviously is the one at highest risk of being a double agent. And as we now know, having read all the, you know, book seven, we know that Snape is indeed a double agent and is working on the side of, old, of, of good, of Dumbledore, and, you know, is not on Voldemort's side. But Voldemort doesn't know that. So, like... Of of all the people to trust, he chooses the one that poses the most risk of him to trust. Why? Yeah. You got to ask yourself why. So. Whew. All right. We've made it, Helene. Yeah. We've made it to the end of our first episode back on our last season. Oh, my gosh. It is truly the beginning of the end. <laughs> couldn't have said it better couldn't have said it better speaking of the beginning of the end while we were on break i'm sure you watched a ton of media that you want to share with us could you give us a rundown yes okay so i obviously watched a lot of things um and um a lot of them i thoroughly enjoyed so i'm just gonna name a few um and then i'll end it with two that i'm currently enjoying um okay but um so first, F Boy Island on HBO Max, amazing, um, very enjoyable. It is if you if you like The Bachelorette, um, it's very similar yes. to that. Um, yes. I, I, it, I, I have partaken in, in yes. F Boy Island. Yes. So for those listeners who have it, it's just it's a very um, it's a reality TV show, dating show. It's great. Just go go uh, like look up the premise. It sounds ridiculous, but honestly, it's very entertaining. Okay. Um, then the next one is first kill on Netflix. That is basically if Buffy, the vampire slayer were a lesbian and black. Um, so it's about a monster hunter, AKA a slayer, vampire slayer and a vampire who fall in love and they're both ladies. And it is, that is mainly why I watched it. Um, honestly didn't, it, it, I didn't completely fall in love with it. The fir- this first season, all for uh, eight episodes are on Netflix right now for the first season, but I didn't hate it. I-, I do think that it has a lot of potential. I think that the, like the angle that they're taking is really interesting. I really do. Wa- I want to see where it goes, but I do think it suffers a lot from like first season 
syndrome kind of and like Mm -hmm. it's it's Mm -hmm. trying to do a lot so also the cgi isn't great but that's because i feel like you don't get a budget wise yeah you don't get a big budget until you prove that you're a profitable show so anyway first kill on netflix go watch that um if you if that sounds interesting to you um i can't remember if i had started outlander by the time um we were finishing before i don't think so hiatus but I did start Outlander. Um, Adri accompanied me on this journey. Um, <laughs> I am officially caught up all six seasons. Uh, I love it. Um, honestly, go uh, uh, historical fantasy romance. It's great. Honestly, but honest, I have to say probably Jamie is the, the perfect uh, male specimen and Scottish accents are a new weakness of mine. Okay. Yep. 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 Um, I can concur to both of those points. Um, you can tell Jamie was written by a woman, oh, you know, hundred percent. I love Jamie, <laughs> but I, I actually was talking to someone recently who read the books, but hasn't seen the show. And, um, I, uh, like, she told me that Jamie, like some of the things that Jamie does in the books that are different than what he does in the show. Um, and it has kind of, uh, encouraged me not to read the books because I think it would ruin him as character. (laughs) So, um, if you didn't like the, the book, like Jamie in the books, like watch the show, he's better. I mean, just from what I've heard, he sounds like such a better character in the show. Anyway. Also, the actor is so beautiful. Oh my God. Sam Hugan or Hogan. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Um, he's beautiful. His he, eyes are, uh, they pierce your soul. He's just, his gaze, his hair. You know, I have a thing for hair. Like, Yeah, yeah he has good hair. Beautiful. He has, he has good hair and a good body. Um, and then uh, the next one is a beautiful gay romp. I love it. It is called Hot, Hot. It's called Heartstopper on Netflix. It's only eight episodes. They're 20, 20 minutes each. I literally sat and I just watched all of them and it like took me the length of like a movie. It was, it, it's so cute. It is like full of joy and beauty. Oh, it's just so adorable. I, it's like literally just like a, a bundle of joy. Go watch Hot, Heartstopper. It does not take a long time. I highly recommend it. Um, and then the last <laughs> one is The Lost City, which um, we've talked about. I finally got around to watching that last weekend. I love it. Um, yes, it is the Daniel Radcliffe, Sandra Bullock, uh, Channing Tatum, Brad Pitt movie. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I love how you describe it. Yes. I, in my head, you know how I describe it? It is the sparkly jumpsuit movie. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, so she wears a glittery jumpsuit for, I'd say, about two thirds of the film. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, Sandra Bullock is a romance novelist, which uh, is just amazing coming I off mean, of my Outlander yeah. time. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's great. I loved it. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe plays an amazing villain. I love him. Um, you all know this about me if you listen to the show. So those are just a few of the things I've watched over the break. Uh, not even the full just list. A few. <laughs> not even the full list. I swear to you, it's I have a problem, but not really. Anyway. Um, However, the two things that I am currently listening to, and in, listening to slash enjoying watching right now, um, I am currently in my first watch ever of of One Tree Hill. I have taken on another teen drama from the early two thousands. It is like my it's what feeds me. Um, yeah, yeah. So One Tree Hill, if you guys don't remember, is the one with Chad Michael Murray uh, with the basketball, and there's Sophia Bush in there. Um, and they were married to each other, and there was like a lot of drama and like behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. apparently they got married like at the end of season two ish, uh, and then got divorced before the show even finished because I think they were married for like a year. Anyway, yep. Um, really, I'm only in season two right now. I'm really interested to see like how that progresses, all that. But it's nine seasons, which I did not know when I started. So I was like, okay, I'm in for a long ride. Also, I saw that the promotion. So I'm sorry if this is spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen one tree hill yet um, it's, it's been it's been years it's yeah it's, it came out in like 2005 or, or you know 2003 so like it's been a while you guys really should should get on that if you're worried about spoilers but um in the promotional photo on hulu um it has like a picture of the cast but chad michael murray isn't in it and so i was like really confused and so i, I looked it up because obviously i'm like what the fuck chad michael murray is literally the main character of the show why isn't Chad Michael Murray in this picture? And apparently he leaves at like the end of season six um, because he wasn't getting paid as much as he wanted to get paid. So I'm really interested now to see how they write his character out because literally the whole show is about 
his character. So, oh, and um, do you want to hear some uh, piping hot tea that I learned about this? Uh, also, background and you know, while this was filming, mm-hmm. he was actually hitting on high school aged girls oh as God. an adult while he was filming this. This is interesting to me because actually, in my research for this, I found out that. Chad Michael Murray is actually a very, very devout Christian. Um, oh, and like hypocrisy. He, your he name does, is, he does you know. like, he like does devotionals and like prayers every day before he goes on set and stuff like that. Like I was reading an article about this. I was like, wow, I did not know that he was that religious. Like he is a very, very religious Christian. So like that surprises me what you said a little bit because of that. But I oh, mean, I'll send you. I'll send you the the podcast. Episode. I mean, I believe you. I believe you. But yeah, that's it's very interesting. I mean, him leaving, like the having to write the main character out of a show after a few seasons. That I, I just gotta say, it's not the first time it's happened. Marissa Cooper was not in the last season of the OC, um, so like I don't know. It, it, I guess it's not as weird as like Ryan Atwood not being in the last season of the OC. Anyway. Um, I'm liking it so far. I'm not a huge sports person. And the first season was very heavy on basketball. Like it was a lot of basketball. And I was like, I want them to talk about basketball less. Um, it's, it's no Ted Lasso is what I'm hearing. No, exactly. So it was kind of hard to get to the, through the first season just because of that. But like eventually they, they focus more on the relationships and the drama and all of that, less on the sports, which I'm happy about. Um, So that is my uh, overview of One True Hill as where I am in it right now. Um, And then the other one is something I'm really fucking excited for, guys. Um, (laughs) The stars of Boy Meets World, one Danielle Fischel, who played Topanga Lawrence, one Ryder Strong, who played Sean Hunter, and one Will Friedell, who played Eric Matthews, came together and started their own podcast. And it is called Pod Meets World. They are doing a rewatch podcast of Boy Meets World. All three of them who have not seen the show either at all or since they since it aired in the early nineties. Um, and they're sitting down and rewatching them in the show and like giving behind the scenes stories and like what they remember from filming and and also just kind of like going through and looking at it and and asking themselves the question, is this show a good show? Does it hold up? Um, I have to say Boy Meets World is one of my all-time favorite shows of all time. Um, I love it so very much. And I have rewatched it many times, both in my childhood and my adulthood. And from my perspective, 100%, hell yeah, it holds up. Um, And I just cannot wait to to listen to this podcast. They are on episode two. They just had uh, Rusty Williams. uh, on who played Al- Alan Matthews. He was the father and they just had him on as, mm-hmm. a, as a guest on the last podcast. And uh, they're going to have lots of other guests. Ben Savage, who plays Corey, unfortunately will not be on the podcast, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> I highly suggest you listening to it. it. It's so fun. I love it so much. And if you love Boy Meets World, you're going to love it. Um, also, humble brag, Danielle Fischel, who plays Topanga, who is hosting this podcast, married a man named Jensen Carp. Spelled the same. We have the same last name. She is a Carp. I am honored to have her in my last name. D- did you know well, um, that, do you remember the the uh, sh- uh, shrimp incident with the Captain Crunch? Yes, that was Jensen Carp. That's the, yeah. that's, that's the, that was Jensen Carp. Yep. Yes, that was Daniel's boy, uh, husband. Yep, so... Um, I don't know if we're related. I kind of want to do some sort of like genealogy to figure out if we're related. Cause I, how cool would it be to say that I'm related by marriage to Topanga Lawrence? Like that would be so cool. I mean, <laughs> let's just say you are and leave it at that. <laughs> I mean, there aren't that many carps out in the world that I've not noticed at least. So I haven't encountered another. So right. I have to say you are related. Period. Uh, yep. There we go. It's decided. Anyway, it's decided. I, I mean, as unless you can't, guys can't tell. This is like one of my favorite segments. So I obviously talked a long time. Sorry, I consume a lot of media, and I want to tell everybody about it. You should never apologize for that. It is <laughs> one of the things I enjoy the most about doing this podcast with you. Aw, I love you. 
I mean, other than, you know, the Harry Potter bits. Yeah, um, Potter bits I just enjoy the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Period. All right. Um, so... <laughs> As uh, previously referenced, I was carved like a turkey and a child came out of me. Right. So I have been, yes, watching things and listening to things as per usual. Um, now the only difference is that I'm doing that while either breastfeeding or pumping. So like I have to limit my media exposure only to those moments because if not, I am going through things too fast because, uh, you know, every pumping session is about half an hour and you have to do it every three hours. So like imagine watching an episode every th- three hours. You can go through things pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so Right now, I'm enjoying uh, my favorite three writers under a trench coat coat, um, (laughs) called Dick Wolf, because I (laughs) refuse to believe that it's one person because he was too prolific. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So uh, the three writers under a trench coat known as Dick Wolf collectively have a show, (laughs) has a show called FBI, um, and it is very in the line of the procedurals that he's known for, like L- Law and Order. Right. Um, this one has an FBI agent who's a brunette called, uh, kind of like reminiscent of Olivia, Olivia Benson. Um, she is, when we meet her, she is a widow. Um, so she's like tough as nails, you know, emotionally like repressed, which, you know, of course, I love because I'm like, yes, I am emotionally stunted too. Um, and a Muslim FBI agent, Egyptian Muslim, of, you know, of Egyptian descent, um, and and Muslim. So it's like kind of like more diverse than you know your usual Dick Wolf fare. Because before it was like, oh, SVU diversity. Well, Stabler is Catholic, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that that's diverse. Yep. That was diverse back in the day. You know what I yeah. mean? Like yeah, that's yeah, yeah. his not he diversity. Was, he was Catholic and Italian, I think. Wasn't he also Italian? I don't know. Italian Italian or Irish? I don't even remember no, he honestly. Been, he might have been Irish, yeah, that's true. Cuz Maloney, I think we're thinking Italian cuz M- Maloney is like an Italian kind of last name. Well, I Chris, think Christopher Chris Maloney, Maloney. I think Chris Maloney is Italian, but is the, Italian. The, the but I think Stabler Irish. is Irish. I think but he did end up going to Rome. So I don't know. I forget. Anyway, I, yeah, it's I digress. Seasons. He's either he's 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 one of the ethnic white people. <laughs> he's either Irish <laughs> or Italian. <laughs> you know, like the people who became white later on in this nation, not like the founding whites. Right. Like the like the British. Um so <laughs> um I'm enjoying that. Uh it has like diverse characters like I said. Um and what I also like about it is that the big boss always tends to be a woman. Okay. Like right. the like boss that. of their unit, you like know, that. is a woman and she's usually tough but fair. Has her flaws. So, like, this is, like, a little bit of a departure from Dick Wolf, who usually has, like, a male boss in a lot of the procedurals. But I have noticed, like, in um, the the Chris Maloney vehicle, Law & Order, um, I forget, Organized Crime, that he has a black woman, lesbian woman boss. (laughs) So I've noticed that he's, you know, he's becoming a little bit more progressive in his old age. Um, So. So that's been great. So this is why I joke it's three writers under a trench coat at this point. Because I'm honestly, like, you know, I, I believe you. Uh, and I've also been enjoying uh, Law and Order Organized Crime, Law and Order Special Victims Unit, and how it ties into organized crime. Um, and yeah. also Law and Order, the original has come back and Hugh Dancy is in it. Yeah. And so is Sam Waterston. Yes. I love Sam Waterston. So he came back. Um, For those of you who are unaware, Sam Watterson is not only um, Saul from oh, Grace and Frankie. Yeah, Grace and Frankie. So he's he, like he's, a lawyer in both of them. <laughs> yes. But he, he's not only that, but he is also the father of one Catherine Watterson who plays Tina 
Goldstein on Fantastic Beasts. Fantastic Beasts. So, yes, he is Beautiful. by by blood uh, a wizard. Yes. So <laughs> love him in Grace and Frankie, by the way. Love that show. Also something I watched uh, over the break because I think it ended while we were on break and I watched the last season. I haven't finished it. You gotta let, very, me, let me know when you have. It's it's more of like those things where I'm like, I'm scared. I'm scared because I know it's the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I Ooh, I, I won't say yeah. anything because but I have I have opinions. But I won't say anything. <laughs> Well, you know, so I've been, again, watching that. Um, I also got uh, the subscription to PBS Masterpiece on Amazon Prime. Right, yes. And I have been watching a lot of that. <laughs> uh, Good. I very sadly learned too late that one of the shows that I was watching called Frankie, Frank, Frankie Drake Mysteries Um ended on a cliffhanger and then didn't get renewed oh i hate when that happens it's the worst and it's a canadian detective show set in the 1920s it's beautiful i love it it convinced <laughs> me to get bangs like this is, <laughs> this is my life oh goodness um yeah but that's what i've been watching we're What's back up? at it we're back at it adri we did it we're back at it all right, so that is it for today's episode. Please join us next time as we talk about Chapter 2 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And this one is titled In Memoriam. Yes, and if you've enjoyed this conversation, which has gone in so many different directions and so many different tangents, but that's, that's what you sign up for when you listen to Accio Politics. That's who we are. Uh, please take a second just one second of your busy, busy lives to give us a, a measly little five-star rating on, App, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you happen to be listening to us right now. Um, as we like to remind you all, it giving us this five-star rating helps new listeners discover our podcast and you know also gives us external validation, which if you have forgotten during the break, uh, we thrive off of external validation. So uh, five-star ratings really help with that. Thanks. Until then, politics managed. Support this show by going to patreon.com slash occupolitics. Our patrons keep this show going. You can find us online at occupolitics.com and we are at occupolitics on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can email us your thoughts at info at occupolitics.com. Leave us a voicemail at 915-996-1699 and you might just hear yourself on the podcast. Adriana Wilson is the founder and creative director of the podcast. Helene Karp is the producer and social media manager. Allison Pullman is the audio wizard and editor who makes us sound so good. Cover art and physical rewards are designed by Adriana Wilson. The views expressed by the hosts and guests are expressly their own and not representative of their employers or associates. Occupolitics is part of the MuggleNet family of podcasts.